Hi class. In this lecture, we're going to move into our discussion of functions, uh, specifically function notation. We'll learn what functions are and how we use them, how you graph functions, things like that. All right, so this lecture here about functions is going to cover the following objectives I want to get through. I want to give you a definition of what a function is. I want to talk about how you do evaluating a function. I want to talk about the domain of a function. So remember, the domain is the allowable inputs into a, into a function. That'll make more sense in a little bit. And then the last I'm going to talk about is the vertical line test. And this is vertical line test is a method for determining if a graph that you have is a function. All right, so first off, a definition of a function. So a function, think of it as a rule, okay? Uh, it's actually more specific. It's a, it's a very specific type of mathematical relationship. Okay, so to talk about a function, we need to give it a name. All right, so we will use letters. So letters are going to define functions. Three of the most common ones are the letters F, G, and H. F is the most common, F for function, okay? We use these letters to represent functions. So for example, we can use the letter F to represent the rule as the following. This F, this function F, is the rule square the number. So take the number and square it. So the formal definition, a function F is a rule that assigns each element X in a set A. So we have one set A, think of this as the inputs, all right? exactly one element called f of x that in parentheses here we're going to call f of x it's not f times x in set b all right so there's going to be each input value is going to go to exactly one think of this as output value all right so we consider functions for which the sets a and b are sets of real numbers all right so that's what we're going to just work with so the symbol this f and then in parentheses x is read f of x or f at x and is called the value of f at x, or the image of x under f. So the set A is called the domain of the function, so the allowable inputs is the domain, and the range of f is the set of all possible values of f of x as x varies throughout the domain. Okay, so the domain is the allowable inputs into the function, Okay, and the range is the, the outputs of the function. Think about it, the possible values the function will take on. Like if you go back and look at this, the square of a number, the outputs here will never be a negative number. So its range is, uh, is zero to all, um, <clears throat> zero, to, zero to positive infinity. The domain, well, it's actually all real numbers because you can square a negative number, right? Like negative five times negative five would just be 25. Okay, so the symbol that represents an arbitrary number in the domain of the function is called the independent variable. So the symbol that represents a number of the range of f is called the dependent variable. So we can write this function f of x is equivalent to the y variable. So it's the dependent variable. f of x is the dependent. Then, the, in, then what's inside the parentheses, the x is the independent variable. Okay, so independent is what we plug in. Dependent, the output depends on what we plug into the function. All right, so it's helpful to think of a function as a machine. Okay, all right, so you take your input x, you plug it into the machine. In our case, the machine will be a mathematical equation, and whoosh, you get the output f of x. All right, so if x is the domain of the function f, then we write, then when x enters the machine, it is accepted as input, so you're inputting into it, and the machine produces the output f of x according to the rules that you're given, like square the number. All right. Thus, we can think of the domain as a set of all possible inputs, and the range is the set of all possible outputs, like I was saying. So another way to picture a function f is by an arrow diagram we see here. So here are the inputs, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and b, here we have the outputs. So what we're saying here is when I input 1, it maps to 20. When I input 2, it also maps to 20. When I input 3, it maps to 30, and when I input 4, it maps to 40. This is a function because each input goes to only one output. It's okay that some of the inputs go to the same output, totally fine. All right, but each input goes to one output. That's what we want to see for a function. All right, so each arrow associates an input of A to the corresponding output B we saw. So since a function associates exactly one output to each input, all right, the, di the diagram we see here, figure A, represents a function. But the diagram in figure B here does not represent a function. Okay, here's why. Each input goes to one output. But if you look over here, 
take your input two. What we're saying is input two goes to both 20 and 30. That violates a function, okay? So inputs can go to the same output, but an input cannot go to two different outputs. That's what we're saying for a function. All right, so let's work an example here. A function f is defined by the formula f of x is equal to x squared plus 4. Okay, so that's my rule. Okay, so I'm going to take the number and square it and then add 4. So express in words how f of x acts on the input x to produce the output f of x. Let's evaluate these, fun these values here, f of 3, f of negative 2, and f of the square root of 5. Let's find uh, the domain and range of f. And let's draw a machine diagram for f. Okay, so let's go through this. Part A. The formula tells us that f first squares the input x and then adds 4 to the result. So f is the function square, square the input, then add 4. That's the machine that's going on here. All right, the values of f are found by substituting x in for the formula f of x is equal to x squared plus 4. So when I go back, I'm going to take these inputs here and whoop, plug it right in and replace wherever I see x is with the input. So f of 3, I'm going to take 3 and square it and add 4, I get 13. f of negative 2, I'm going to take negative 2 and square it. That gets me positive 4 plus 4, that's how I get my 8. And the square root of 5, well the square root of 5 squared is just 5 plus 4 gets me 9. All I did was plug it in and, and work through the answers there. Okay, so what is the uh, domain here? All right, the domain of S consists of all possible inputs, right? Like um, there's no, no number I can't plug in here. Okay, so it's all real values. Okay, so since we can evaluate the formula f of x for every real number, the domain of f is just the set of real numbers. All real numbers can go into it. All right, but what about the range, right? So the range of S consists of all possible outputs. Well, because when you square something, it's always greater than or equal to zero for all real numbers. We're going to notice that x squared plus 4 is always greater than or equal to 4. It can never be less than 4. So for every output of f, we have f of x is greater than or equal to 4. So thus the range of f is the values y such that y is greater than or equal to 4. Or in set notation, it's closed bracket close parentheses 4 comma to infinity open bracket all right so a machine diagram for this here you can kind of see what we we're talking about here so I'm going to take my x input I'm going to square and add 4 and my output is just x squared plus 4 and I'll just use this example of 3 when I took 3 and I plugged it into my machine it gave me 13 as the output and that's what we're seeing with this machine diagram all right, let's go on and talk a little bit more detail about the domain of a function here. All right, so we know the domain of a function is a set of all inputs for the function. So the domain of a function may be stated explicitly in examples. So for example, if we have uh, f of x is equal to x squared, and you see something like this, this is telling you I'm restricting the domain. And the domain is a set of all real numbers, uh, x, for which x is between 0 and 5 inclusive. Okay, so this is a, a case where they're just telling you the domain right here. They're restricting it for some reason. All right, so if the function is given by an algebraic expression and the domain is not stated explicitly, then by, then by convention, the domain of the function is the domain of the algebraic expression. All right, what that is, that is the set of all real numbers for which the expression is defined as a real number. All right, so for example, let me give you these two functions here. All right, one's a rational expression and one's a radical. So I'm saying f of x is equal to 1 over x minus 4. So you just have to look at this and say, okay, well, what's the domain? What values could I plug into this? Well, I can't plug 4 in, right? Okay, because then I'll get a divide by 0, and we can never have that. So the function f here, this first one, is not defined at x is equal to 4. Okay, but I can plug in every other number. So its domain is x such that x is not equal to 4. That tells me it's everything else g of x here this is equal to the square root of x well can you plug a negative under the uh, radical no you get an imaginary number then right so the function g is not defined for negative x so its domain is x such that x is greater than or equal to zero so when you're given these expressions just think like well you know what values of x will make it undefined those cannot be in the domain
All right, let's move on and talk about graphs of functions. All right, so what I want to do now is I want to sketch the graphs of the following functions. f of x is equal to x squared, g of x is equal to x cubed, and h of x is equal to the square root of x. All right, if you remember back at the beginning of these slides here, all these functions are, they're just another way of saying y. So if I ask you to sketch y is equal to x squared, or y is equal to x cubed, or y is equal to the square root of x, what you would do is you would just make a table of values, right? And you'd plug in some negatives, you'd plug in zero, you'd plug in some positives, and then you'd plot the points given on those tables and join them by a smooth curve. So I won't go through this in too much detail, but like what you're seeing here for this first one, I pick zero, plus and minus one half, plus and minus one, plus and minus two, and plus and minus three. I got these values here. Same thing with x cubed, produces these values. And obviously I can't plug in negatives here. So I picked a zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So you're gonna plot these as ordered pairs. This is my x value, this is my y value. This is my x right here, these are my y's. These are my x, these are my y's. So when you plot them, this is what you see. These are the dots represent the points. And then once you got these points, you can see the graph. So you're going to draw a nice smooth curve through it. Smooth curve through it and a smooth curve through it. So you're going to plot graphs, okay, of functions just as you would with um, algebraic expressions, okay? Just like you would with the table of values, find ordered pairs, plot them, and, and sketch the graph through it. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about real quick is the vertical line test. Okay, and which graphs represent functions, or how can you tell if you just look at a graph if it's a function? So the graph of a function is a curve in the xy plane. Okay, but the question arises which curves in the xy plane are graphs of functions? All right, this is answered by the following test. Okay, this is the vertical line test. A curve in the coordinate plane is a graph of a function if and only if no vertical line intersects the curve more than once. Okay, so if you were to draw a vertical line through the graph here, like this one, any vertical line, if this graph here represented our function, it passes through it only once. So this is a graph of a function. If you look here, okay, if you were to draw the vertical line here, boom, boom, it hits it twice. This is not a graph of a function, okay? The reason is what you're seeing here is the value A corresponds to two outputs. It corresponds to the, both the value B and both the value C, so it's not a function. All right, class, I hope that helped uh, as a quick introduction to what functions are.